Hello everyone and um, welcome back to the LICAF Live live studio and um, for this session we're absolutely delighted to be welcoming uh, Martin Rosen who is one of the UK's giants of political cartooning. I hope you won't mind me describing him like that. Um, and for those of you who don't um, already know his amazing work, um, over the past 30 years his work has actually appeared regularly in a whole raft of um, newspapers, The Guardian, The Daily Mirror, The Times, the Spectator magazine and The Independent on Sunday. He's produced as well a raft of books, uh, gravel, uh, gravel, graphic novelizations, um, of which no doubt we'll um, speak about over the course of the next hour. And he's also chair of the British Cartoonists Association. I served twice, rather interestingly, as vice president of the Zoological Society of London. Martin, welcome. Hello, Julie. Live Hi. from Russian. <laughs> it's really great to have you here and thank you for wearing that wonderful hat um maybe you could tell people what it is and how well, you came about it i mean the the reason i got the hat was uh when jeremy corbyn was leader of the labor party i started drawing him I, actually in a quite affectionate way wearing a hat like this because he did wear a hat like this it's called a prince heinrich hat it's named after the kaiser's brother who used to, who popularized this kind of hat and lenin wore one as well and so did jeremy corbyn um, and I put a little red star in the middle of it. This, in fact, is a badge I was given on the streets of Moscow in 1976 in exchange for a stick wow. of spearmint gum. But, you know, Corbin Easters, um, any of you out there, nice to see you, <laughs> and, um, would get very, very, very defensive. And I had somebody on social media accuse me of being personally responsible for the existence of food banks in this country because of the way I drew Jeremy Corbyn's hat. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> there's an accolade. The political cartoon or of the hat. <laughs> I just wear it as a symbol of, um, of the powers of cartoons. Absolutely. Well, I know that you've got um, an extraordinary presentation um, to give to us uh, today, but I, I just wondered, I suppose, when you were little, you weren't sort of sat there thinking, when I grow up, I'd like to be a political cartoonist. Or were you? How did you get into the business well, in the first place? I was. Um, I, was <laughs> drawing, I was drawing all the time. I, where it comes from, I've no idea. But I think any, anybody in this craft would say the same, that somehow or other they've got this stuff in their head that they're able to get out on a piece of paper through the end of their arm. And um, I was obsessed with politics. I was obsessed with satire. I was obsessed with drawing. And when I was 10, it was actually almost a kind of epiphany that I discovered in my sister's history school textbook, Illustrated History of Britain, 1780 to 1950, all these cartoons from Gilray and Rowlandson through Cruikshank, Tenniel, up to David Lowe. And I just thought these were the most wonderful things I'd ever seen in my life. And I remember going to my father's old desk and finding some old steel nibs and getting them out and trying to cross hatch in the way that Gilray etched. And so my life was transformed. And so I thought, wouldn't it be great if I was a political cartoonist? And I spent a lot of time at school doing cartoons. Um, I went to Cambridge University where uh, I was meant to be reading English literature, but I didn't read much of it because I spent all my time doing cartoons for two <laughs> student papers. Got a really bad degree, um, which is part of the course in cartooning circles, you know. You <laughs> Sounds normal, yeah. The way you should carry on. And uh, I had an idea for a series of really arcane puns about the history of socialism. Um, an example of which is... Proudhon and Bakunin having tea in Tunbridge Wells and Bakunin is spitting out his tea saying, Jesus Christ, Proudhon, this is disgusting. This isn't property, to which Proudhon replies, but property is theft. <laughs> I made that joke in 1982. I made um, and the New Statesman took up, took up this series and ran it for a year and then a book came out of it. And then I started working for various magazines and their journalists moved up to the Nationals. And so I was working in the Nationals by the time I was 26. Wow. Been there ever since. Wow. Um, but not just that, before we get onto this presentation, sorry, we could talk all day, but you also have this amazing track record as well in sort of long form graphic novels. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah my, tell my, us a bit. Tell side, us a bit more. Side, my side projects, let's put it like that. And uh, again, it, it's one of those sort of happy accidents. Initially, it was the, the third book I was going to do, my agent said, You've done politics, politics is boring, forget it. What else do you really, really hate? And I said, I really, really hate T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. And he said, okay, go away and think about a way of doing that. And I thought of colouring books and other things. And then I suddenly had this flash of inspiration that there's a scene in the poem, uh, section four of the poem, Flemus the Phoenician, a fortnight dead. 
Um, and I suddenly, in the way cartoonist minds work, I connected that with that scene in the Howard Hawks film, The Big Sleep, starring Humphrey Bogart as Philip Marlowe, where they dredge the Sternwood family's Packard with the chauffeur inside it out of the bay. And it, sort of, it was Phlebas the Phoenician, he'd been dead a fortnight, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all suddenly there. It was, it was a film noir, was a, the wasteland was a film noir. Uh, and a comic book seemed to be the obvious way to do it because I couldn't make a film. Um, the Elliot estate tried to suppress it, wouldn't mm -hmm. let me put any of the original stuff. Um, it was meant to be taking the piss, it was originally uh, some satire, but um, although it got pulped after three years because they didn't manage to sell it properly, it had become a set text in American universities. Wow. <laughs> and it's, and it's, still, it's still in print. Nice. Uh, it's been reissued by Picador, then it's now in print from uh, Seagull Books who reprint stuff uh, based in Kolkata. And after that, I vowed I'd never do another graphic novel. Then somebody said, um, somebody in a publisher in Ireland suggested I should do Tristram Shandy, the great 18th century anti-novel. And it was such a ludicrous proposition. I thought, yes, <laughs> yes, that, that makes complete sense because it's such a ludicrous proposition. And after I did that, I thought, I'll do Gulliver's Travels. Um, and I wanted to do that specifically because after the death of Diana, everybody was saying, well, after this terrible thing, satire is dead. Nonsense, absolute nonsense. We need satire as much as we need laughter because otherwise we'd go mad with existentialist terror. And the idea that, you know, if, if, if satire isn't dead after Auschwitz and Hiroshima, it's never going to die. Mm. And it never will die because we need it. And I had the whole thing in my head, an updated version of Gulliver's Travels, but I needed new labour to work through its tragic cycle to the end. So I didn't actually <laughs> until 2009 and it was published 2011. And then I did the Communist Manifesto um, at the suggestion of the wonderful people at Self Made Hero, best publishers I've ever worked for. Yeah, they're wonderful. They're absolutely wonderful. Because they're yeah. small and therefore they're hungry. <laughs> so, you know, big publishers, they'll take your book, throw it on the roof, they don't care. Hmm. Um, anyway, Emma phoned me up and said, uh, Communist Manifesto, what about doing that? And again, it's one of those ludicrous ideas, but I suddenly had it all fully formed in my head. And right. that book, ironically enough, has earned me more money than any of the other books, of which there are about 30, which I've authored, has ever earned. And uh, Carl would be proud. He yes, it's the first for communism out there. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> communism doesn't work. Obviously it does. <laughs> and have you got, um, before we move on, because you're going to give us um, a really wonderful kind of insight into the cartoons that you've been producing, particularly over recent times, but also historically. Um, what have you got another project in the in the pipeline at the moment? Are you uh, allowed to tell us? I, if you am, have? I am just about to start illustrating a book by the um, lawyer Bleep Sand about oh. the history of the International Court. Wow. So it sounds really dull and dire, but it's not. It's it's a facet. It's an extraordinary narrative arc about how the International Court um, was set up hundred years ago. Of course, it only really came into its own at the Nuremberg Tribunals, which where, where the idea of genocide was formulated by British lawyers. <laughs> uh, and last year, when Jeremy Hunt was still Foreign Secretary, the UN voted that Britain should give the Chagos Islands back to the Chagos Arts, who had the International Court had judged that we were unjustly, they had been unjustly and unfairly removed from their homeland and we should let them return and Britain said no they were going to ignore the judgment of the international court so we talk about Boris Johnson ignoring international law Theresa May's government was ignoring international law and we are now a rogue state and we have been for the last 18 months mm -hmm. and we're not even aware of it that things have sunk so low in this country that we are we, we actually should be an, an international pariah we shouldn't leave the European Union they should throw us out. <laughs> well, I think they're now kind of doing that, aren't they? It's got so uh, very, very messy. But um, what would be great is if we could move to the presentation which you've lovingly prepared for us. Um, and also as, as we travel, um, kind of explain to people who maybe don't look at the political cartoons or haven't seen that many of them, you know, how these things actually work, what goes through your head in terms of, you know, the subject and then how you actually tackle it, if, if you don't mind, as you're running through these amazing images. And I've, we've got the, um, the wonderful Chris's assistant here who will um, move the slides on when you tell him. Yeah, sure. Well, um, I'm, my email inbox is constantly filled with people suggesting ideas for cartoons to me, normally um, things which are their own political hobby horses. And I always have to explain to them, I can only do a cartoon about what's actually happening in the news. 
That's how newspaper cartoons work. That's not how all political cartoons work, but how newspaper cartoons work. Although in the history of visual satire, um, since uh, visual satire became part of the political conversation in this country, which was in 1695 when they forgot to renew the Royal Licensing Act, so suddenly press censorship was gone, and there was this mushrooming of the satire, uh, mm. both visual and textual satire. Um, and in that 300 period, 325 year period, these cartoons had only been appearing in newspapers since 1900. So it's only a third of that period we've been parasitizing off newspapers, but nonetheless, we're part of the newspaper agenda, we're part of the topography of newspapers. Uh, and it's where I think cartoons thrive best because they're surrounded by these serried ranks of, of, of words. And there's an oasis of visual anarchy in the middle of it all. I'm a great um, champion of the image as opposed to the written text. Um, the oldest known human drawing is over 40,000 years old. The oldest known Neanderthal drawing is 111,000 years old. We have no idea what it means because we don't think like Neanderthals. Um, but we've been doing this stuff as long as we've been the kind of human beings we are, which is about 50,000 years. Language is about 50,000 years old. We've been drawing probably for the same length of time because we need to get this mad theoretic stuff inside our heads outside to re-narrativize it in order to take control of it. That's what art is about, replaying reality in safe mode and visual satire is as much a part of that as anything else um, because we take possession of the people who are in, supposedly in charge of our destinies in this case in this cartoon uh, the chief medical officer chris witty the prime minister and the health secretary who um, are overseeing the deaths and have overseen the deaths of tens of thousands of their fellow citizens um, we can make some meaning of our lives by transforming these people through the magic of caricature so they turn into puppets who I'm in control of and we can hold them up to mockery because mockery as I was saying you know we need satire otherwise we go insane with existentialist terror like we need laughter laughter is a fundamental human evolutionary survival tool otherwise we would literally go insane with the horrors that life throws at us from death sex our leaders other people shit the rest of it and we laugh at all of these things <laughs> we would go mad and this cartoon was when Manchester was put under, or the North was put under, um, a local lockdown in, in the summer. And it's just the way the whole thing has been played by the political and medical establishment. So it's Chris Whitty saying, go back to your homes unless you live in someone else's and unless you're going uh, to the pub, unless you're going to on staycation, unless, hang on, I've just lost the picture there, but on it go, I haven't got that image in front of me. Oh, there we go. Um, uh, unless you're shielding or returning to work, unless you're not, and you must do so immediately, unless you can do so much earlier, happy Eid. <laughs> Eid, of Eid. And there is the clown Johnson who saying hands, knees and bumped off the daisy. Uh, and a lot of people like this. Obviously, it's a pastiche of the Lowry. They liked it because these are horrific times and horrific things are happening. And actually, if you can laugh at this monumental shit show, it means that you release the endorphins that actually make us feel better. And they help us survive. Um, as George Orwell said, every joke is a tiny revolution. It's a tiny straw to clutch at in the midst of all the horror. So anyway, if we could have the next slide, please, Chris. Um, and in constructing political cartoons, I have, I have um, lots of little tropes, as it were. They're things that appear over and over again. And this is my favorite one uh, uh, because it, it more or less sums up the attitude a political cartoon is and a political cartoon should have. And what it is, is a fur cup, obviously. It's a cup made out of fur. And if you just move to the next slide, please, Chris. Uh, it's a homage to Merritt Oppenheim's famous uh, object, which appeared at the 1936 British Surrealist Exhibition, which is a cup and saucer made out of fur. And it's a surrealist trope. And like most surrealist tropes, it should be pronounced with a thick French accent. So it's a fur cup. A fur cup. Another massive fur cup from the... <laughs> The government has fur cupped once more. And <laughs> next slide, please. This little darling's been appearing in my cartoons since about the second year of the coalition, so about 2012. And now people look out for it. They just want to, want to know where the fur cup is. So if you recall, 
in the middle of last year, we just had this kind of groundhog day, repetition of the mess that was Brexit. Were we going to leave? Weren't we going to leave? It was just going round and round in circles. This is another thing that political cartoonists do. We steal other artists, better artists imagery. So you'll have seen I stole from Lowry earlier on. This is Escher's famous staircase, um, the optical illusion, which goes round and round and round. And there's the fur cup throwing up over the side of it. Um, although in the last months of the dying May administration, which seems like a thousand years ago, it was in fact about, um, you know, sort of 16 months ago, less than that, 15 months ago. Um, if you have the next slide, please, Chris. Things were getting so bad as a cartoonist. This, I, I very rarely break the fourth wall and depict myself in my cartoons and sort of... Um, show what's happening behind the scenes but it just it got to the point where I didn't know what else to do and I've talked to my colleagues and say God's sake how many times can we do the Titanic falling off a cliff uh, and all the rest of it <laughs> uh, right but also I need meta visual metaphors uh, for pitiful desperation abject humiliation grotesque cynicism toe curlingly embarrassing obduracy and soul crushing boredom okay sorry squire we're all out uh, <laughs> and you see the, the fur cup looking on in horror next to a box of guano based brown paint so <laughs> you could work that one out for yourselves i think <laughs> um, on to the next one um another this is just going chronologically basically through the last year so then uh, boris johnson takes over for a short time I mean, i'm drawing i've been drawing johnson for years and i wish i didn't have to but uh, he is there so i was trying to transform him into a into an inflatable um clown horrific clown what's the name of that clown out of um the stephen king thing oh it is it from it no anyway i can't remember no I'm sure i'm sure that they'll be right out there will be yeah <laughs> throwing in suggestions so but uh, but actually the, the the um the straightforward johnson is more horrific than any sinister evil clown could be but of course this is stolen from the clockwork orange because we have these fanatic cranks in charge um, you'll see all the fur cups in the background have actually started melting in horror at the start of the silly season. And um, next slide, please, Chris. And then we had that sort of that weird period where he tried to prorogue Parliament. He tried to push through a no deal. He was more or less the sort of prisoner of this hung Parliament. And there he is, as Rapunzel. And there is Jeremy Corbyn in the foreground wearing his, uh, his cap like this. Um, until we, we had the election. And because the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party agreed to an election they didn't have to agree to. They should have said, get Brexit done, then we'll have an election. Next slide, please. We got this one. <laughs> I'm really immensely proud of this culture. <laughs> That's it's genius. Brilliant. It's one of those weird things because cartoonists suffer from a kind of Stockholm syndrome. Um, and I know my friend and colleague, Steve Bell, certainly manifested this, if uh, some of you remember that far back, during John Major's leadership, um, ministry he used to depict major with his underpants on the outside of his trousers like a kind of crap superman and they were air checks underpants just adding to the nerdiness of john major and steve once told me that he absolutely loved just putting in the dots for the holes on the air checks underpants it was like zen calligraphy it was a very calming thing for him to do and um, when Major got voted out in 97, I rang up and said, how do you feel about it? I said, I've lost my reason for living, because he could no longer paint the underpants. Um, because we fall in love with our victims. I, I actually got genuine, quite pervy pleasure out of drawing <laughs> George Osborne, who I think is an appalling man. And I just loved the fact that his mouth was moving further and further around the back of his head as he sneered and smirked all the time, and that his skull was clearly made out of gristle and not out of bone and was starting to get, starting to get floppy. Uh, and in a way, I also sort of slightly love drawing Boris Johnson because I know he hates this. I have met Johnson several times, and one time after he became mayor of London, and I was at, uh, I was then working for the Spectator, and I come out, I came out of this party at the Spectator, and he was waiting to go in. He had his security men around. Um, who were casing the joint to make sure people like me weren't in there. And I said, hello, Boris, so what's it feel like having the mantle of office on your slender shoulders? And he said, all these people are doing these horrible cartoons about me. And you know, he wasn't kidding. He wasn't, he wasn't banter. He was wondering why on earth we weren't just saying, oh, Boris, you're so lovely. Trip over your cock again, because you're so funny. Because he genuinely thinks that. I think it's <laughs> 
I think his entire life is can be summed up with him jumping off a climbing train saying, look at me, dad. And that's all it is. That's all there is to it. Um, so <laughs> I had this idea in my head for weeks throughout the election. There was a part of me praying for the impossible, praying for another hung parliament, even a Labour victory or whatever. But I also wanted him to win because I wanted to do this cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a terrible betrayal of all my political principles, but um, but I just think I just I was just so pleased with getting the gag, and nobody else had got it first. Which is you know extraordinary because it seems to me just the obvious joke. Anyway, next one, please. And then we have the the glories of um, of Brexit Day, mm -hmm. and in fact I drew this or painted this after I now know I was recovering from having COVID, which I got in the middle of January. I took an antibody test subsequently. And it, I had all the symptoms except a really bad cough. It didn't get to my lungs, I'm told by a doctor friend of mine, because I sleep on my stomach. And I take statins, and apparently that makes a difference. But uh, I had every other symptom. Um, a fever for two weeks. And uh, the Guardian, rather nervously, because I'd taken time off, and I never take time off, because even if I'm ill, I can still sort of join you. But I couldn't draw for more than 10 minutes without sleeping for about four hours. And they rather nervously said, you are going to be able to file on Brexit day, aren't you? <laughs> and, um, and this one actually took me two days. Most of the stuff you've seen so far takes three or four hours, but this took me two days because it was, because it was in no fit state. But uh, I had to be there. I had to be the person who was marking this great historic event. Because, and next slide, please. Because we thought that's how Boris Johnson would reach his apotheosis. I drew this in March 2016, slightly prophetically, as opposed to pathetically, I think. Um, still enormously proud of that one, having got Trump and Johnson bang to rights. And they are, as I said, um, when we were both at the National <laughs> Cartoon Society Festival last year in California, Julie, and I, I gave a presentation in my work. And yeah, I, I remember it very well. I, I introduced the Americans to the concept, two cheeks of the same arse. They've never heard of it. <laughs> and <the next> one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Like this one, when, when he was, um, <laughs> when he was uh, mayor of London, he dismissed Islamic terrorists as a bunch of wankers, showing the statesmanlike oratory of the great Pericles, of whom I'm sure he, he models himself on. And so I base this, on, obviously, if you have the next one, please, Chris, on uh, this famous image of a barn. <laughs> and some um, equal-minded anarchist poster makers from um, who, who are wonderful, wonderful guys, and they printed posters of this. Next slide, please. Uh, and they, and these are big posters, and they put these up in Johnson's Uxbridge constituency, Christmas 2018. And the next one, please. And this is on the main drag. This is on the main route going through Uxbridge, and they were there for 12 hours before they got removed. And I think that's one of the, the finest day's work I've done. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Move on to the next one, please. You see that Johnson has, has an infinite variety. Here he is as Onan the Barbarian. And uh, the next one, um, here he is uh, as a Russian. I mean, I have been saying publicly from public platforms, uh, on the broadcast media, uh, on social media, for at least the last nine years that Boris Johnson is quite clearly a KGB sleeper agent. <laughs> Only KGB would be clever enough and fiendish enough to realize that the Brits are so dumb they'd fall for this wholly unconvincing caricature of an upper-class Englishman. And don't tell anyone, he's called Boris. <laughs> he's hiding in clear sight like Jimmy Savile. I mean, it, it, he's there he's, he, he, and his job is to destroy <laughs> British democracy and destroy Britain standing in the world. And he's doing a brilliant job. He's absolutely perfect. He'll go back one day and he'll get his order of Lenin. Um, anyway, here he is, uh, as, next one please, as Jabba the Hutt. And uh, here he is, next one, as described by Charles Moore, now Lord Moore, um, as a greasy piglet. Um, you'll notice there's a character here, and the last one we had a Darth Vader character here, we've got an apple in his gob. Next one, please. Here he is as an internet troll, uh, as the king of the world, and next to him is one of the most wonderful things about Boris Johnson. The next one, please, uh, who I hear showed the, the legacy of... Um, the last three Tory prime ministers. Uh, and the next one, please, which is, of course, Dominic Cummings. 
I mean, Dominic Cummings is, is, is a profoundly dangerous person because he thinks he's an evil genius, and he's not. He's a sort of 11-year-old nut job uh, who, um, who, who thinks that he can control the world by doing, I don't know, Minecraft or something like that. He's, he's, I mean, he's just a deranged nerd um, who, who thinks he's a genius, and he's not. Uh, but the great thing about him, just like Boris Johnson is clearly a KGB agent, Dominic Cummings is clearly the greatest example the world has ever seen of nominative determinism. So we have the next one, please. His name is Cummings. His name is Cummings. <laughs> what ho, Cummings, that get spaffing and show the grumpsters what we're full of British spunk. That, I mean, this is the kind of thing I, I through the <laughs> wonders of visual satire, I get this stuff published in national newspapers because it's part of this 300 year long tradition I've been talking about, that we've been the foul mouth part of the political conversation for over 300 years. And why nobody else has picked up on the fact that he's called Cummings and he's clearly a wanker. <laughs> <laughs> but next one, please. So that's it. They've got their Brexit, the world's burning, 2000, this is the beginning of 2020. It's not looking that great. You know, Australia's on fire. We're led by populist idiots, uh, whether it's a guy in Australia or Xi or Trump or Modi or a murderous thug in charge of Saudi Arabia or all the rest of them, Putin, all these, you know, populist strong men who have one thing in common. They can't stand cartoons. That Xi, the most, second most powerful man on earth, is so terrified of cartoons that he's banned Winnie the Pooh because a Chinese dissident cartoonist portrayed him as Winnie the Pooh. So he's banned Winnie the Pooh in China because he's so strong. <laughs> it's the most hardly thing I heard last year that he banned Winnie the Pooh. Anyway, it wasn't going to be the environmental catastrophe. We've got that one in store. Next slide, please. Instead, it was going to be this horrific disease. Uh, and this was the, the second cartoon I did after I recovered from what I now know was COVID, when it appeared to be in China and Xi was trying to cover it up and there was him as a face mask. And, and it sort of slowly crept up on us, this devastating disease. So the next one, please. Um, without anybody taking it seriously. So there's Cummings appointing weirdos and misfits. Uh, and there he is measuring the head of the great Cthulhu while uh, behind him he has um, Skeletor and the Supreme Dalek and a Midwich Cuckoo and a member of the uh, Hitler Youth and Toby Young uh, and um, guys coming and saying relax guys nothing to do with Corona we're just here from human resources so the next one please um, but politics tries to carry on things try to carry on as normal here is Johnson after the announcement of uh, his impending uh, love child, I think we should call Wilfred, as they remain unmarried. Um, <laughs> and that's based on Jan van Eyck's The Marriage of the Arnold Feeney. And there's the next one. And, and Johnson just disappeared from months on end. The country was underwater. This terrible disease was coming. And said, now, look here, I've shown my face in public. What more do you bloody want? And strangely prophetic, because he hadn't had it then. Next one, please. Here he is as the was the <laughs> jaws. Maybe we should close things down. And then, next one, please. Uh, he gets COVID. He gets COVID for the obvious reason that he's gone around shaking hands with people, boasting about it, not taking anything seriously. And, you know, from what I hear uh, on the journalistic grapevine, he was that close to being intubated and put on a ventilator. But he said, we can't do that because if it's known that I'm on a ventilator, the country will just fall to pieces. I don't know whether it would have done or not. Um, so he has done serious damage to his lungs. The reason why he looks as terrible as he is is because he is terrible. He's in really, really bad health. He is not fit to serve as prime minister. But we're not meant to know that. We're meant to think he's as healthy as a sack full of butcher's dogs, or whatever his phrase was. Anyway, this was based on, next one, please. Um, this is based on uh, a painting by Edvard Munch, and the next one, please. And uh, meanwhile, we have uh, <laughs> we have um, little Matt, or killer Matt, as I prefer to call him, as he's responsible for the deaths of more of his fellow citizens than Goering. Uh, Don't bring out your dead, stay indoors and with them until you need to eat them, as he was saying, you know, 
don't start hoarding food. And, um, and in the middle of all this, here I am still wearing my Corbyn hat, the Labour Party finally elects a new leader. Uh, and poor old Keir Starmer hasn't really had much of a look in, but I did manage to produce this because I suddenly looked at him and realised what he looked like. So it's the next slide, please. And he does, <laughs> he does look like a lump of old oak. <laughs> it's very unfortunate, but that's him to the life. It could be a photograph. In fact, parts of it are a photograph. Um, meanwhile, the horrors of COVID carry on. And, and it, it's actually a, a serious question of how do people like me and the purpose of my art, if it is art, is, I think of it as journalism, is, is to make people laugh, but also to make them think and also to reflect what's happening in the news, what's happening nationally, to somehow get into our collective id. And what do you do when you're surrounded by tens of thousands of people who are dying to a large extent through the maladministration of a government of, of pranks and incompetence? Um, so, so, the next slide please. At Easter, I did a cartoon which wasn't funny at all, it wasn't meant to be funny, it was actually meant to be desperately sad. And uh, a lot of people responded accordingly that they recognised this, because these are the people who were saving lives, often at the risk of their own lives. And it's Easter and they're carrying their crosses into the care homes. So I was, I was rather proud of that because, you know, poignancy is in our armoury as well as laughter. Uh, the Prime Minister is not being intubated in St Thomas's Hospital. Next one, please. There aren't enough face masks, but they've got the face mask. But of course, um, thoughts and prayers for the Prime Minister. There he is, like uh, the ascension of Christ, not the ascension, the, um, the resurrection of Christ. Uh, and they're praying, winging a prayer rather than thoughts and prayers. And they've, of course, obviously put the, the face masks on the wrong parts of their faces. Um, the next one, please. I did this for um, an American underground comic who's done a lot of plague comics this year. Uh, again, surprisingly prophetic as I did this in the beginning of April. So there is Trump who now has COVID. Johnson who had COVID. My plague pits are the best plague pits, the deepest plague pits, the fullest plague pits. I mean, it is, it is terrifying that these people are nominally in charge of the world. The next one, please. <laughs> and uh, this is poor old Matt Hancock as the scapegoat because he will, they, if there is ever a national uh, you know, public inquiry, they're just going to say it's his fault. And he knows that. That's why he looks as though he can smell his soul rotting inside him all the time. And he hasn't resigned. He hasn't named names. He hasn't done anything. He's just stuck in there appointing Dido Harding to get more ridiculous jobs. Uh, next one, please. That's obviously based on the Holman Hunt painting. And this was Johnson after he gets back. Uh, from hospital and he goes and delivers this speech and you can tell he's just a genuinely ill man. So I do tend to paint him with his pyjamas poking through the top of his suit. Next one please. And then we had what was meant to be a great national celebration of peddling this uh, idea of us as a nation who won the Second World War. Well actually we w helped win the Second World War but it was actually won by the Red Army. Um, and again it's using poignancy. So here is a care home with the veterans of the great war against fascism. And most of them are dead because people were let out of hospital into care homes without being tested to see whether they had COVID or not. And it swept through as a kind of gerontocide, sort of killing off the old. And it's, it's a scandal. It's an absolute scandal. It makes me really, really angry. And we should be disgusted with these people. Um, next one, please. Not least of all because of their inability to get on top of anything, to have a clear message, to know what they're doing, to admit that they're wrong, to admit they've got things wrong, to say that there's possibly time for a national government, possibly time to stop posturing around, um, making stupid speeches that mean nothing. You know, uh, oh, um, uh, staying alert. I mean, what does it mean? <laughs> what do they value more? Do they value our lives or do they value the economy? Either is equally valid, but just say so. But of course, they have no idea what they're doing. Next one, please. And the breathtaking hypocrisy of these people who underfunded the health service for 10 years, saying we've got to clap to support the health service. So here is uh, Pretty Patel. Clap, 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 clap. And then, of course, she slaps somebody around the face when she introduces an immigration uh, bill, which is, which is uh, likely to lead to thousands of national health staff being deported. Next one, please. 
And just to top it all, old Dom doms off to Castle Barnard. So uh, it stinks. Because you're exceptional, Dom, poor Omberg. I was rather pleased with this one. I can't actually remember what I wrote <laughs> on the eye chart um, stuck on Barnard Castle, which is a fur cut, by the way. Um, but it's probably the kind of thing which shouldn't appear in the national newspaper. Next one, please. And here they are when six people were allowed to meet in a public place. So there you've got six of them, of course, including the Grim Reaper. Sorry, guys. I'm late. It's been crazy. And then the next one, which was the second wave. <laughs> Did that in May. And then the next one. And in the midst of all this, as it becomes growingly obvious, the people who consider themselves to be the National Party of Government, who consider themselves to be synonymous with Britain, are quite incapable of running the country because they're incompetent cranks. And everything starts falling to pieces because if you chip away at the facade of Britain that won the Second World War single-handedly, but of course it didn't, won it with the support of an empire which it had acquired through theft and conquest, we're not necessarily always the good guys, that actually we have a very, very grisly, gruesome past based on theft and murder and conquest. And you have Pretty Patel, who was once described to me by one of Modi's leading advisors, an old friend of my wife's, as thick and mad. And I think that's something which is worth having as, a, as an epitaph when they finally write it and when she dies. Many, many centuries from now, I hope. You know, um, there she is saying that you've got to deal with people attacking statues because that's the most important thing. You've got to deal with people attacking statues. So I quoted from Thomas Paine in um, Reflections on the French Revolution. Um, you know, in mourning the plumage, they forgot, a, they forgot the dying bird when he's attacking Edmund Burke's um, uh, attacks on the French Revolution. Um, uh, there they are on their statues. A nice one of, um, of Killer Matt there. They died to save his R's. I was rather pleased with that. <laughs> um, anyway, next one, please. And uh, then we have the fourth anniversary of the referendum, the Brexit referendum, which has partly got us where we are now. This mess we're in. I'm not going to say, you know, anything about that, except that it's happened, that there are good reasons to leave the European Union and there are bad reasons to leave the European Union. It is as it is. But the way it's been handled is so breathtakingly stupid. Let's take a disunited country and disunited even more. And so I just had the Brexit as, um, as Damien from the Omen, um, having killed off Cameron and killed off Theresa May, then looking at Daddy, because it will probably kill off Johnson as well, because it's a sort of hideous monster, um, irrespective of the rightness or the wrongness of it. Next one, please. And we're not allowed to go to the beaches. This is based on the famous Skegness, it's so bracing poster and the next one and that's delving into the as I was saying you know the history of where the wealth of the city of London comes from it comes from slavery and conquest and theft and all through this period I've been trying to lighten up the nation by issuing a series of challenges on Twitter it started during the election when I didn't know how to draw Matt Hancock so I said hey let's have a let's draw Matt Hancock challenge and it went on from there and now you know every month I get people to draw new one. We get hundreds of entries from just, you don't get anything. If you win, I send the winner a prize of, of a book of mine. But it seems to have developed a kind of life of its own. And um, during the middle of the, the, the lockdown, next one, please. Um, there was, uh, hang on. No, no, sorry. This is the pub's opening. It's the one after that. So this is based on Hogarth's Gin Lane, obviously. It's this one, yeah. Desmond Swain, the MP for the New Forest, a, a kind of prehistorically moronic Tory MP, uh, said that the wearing of masks, the imposition of masks, was, was, was the greatest imposition on Brit Britain, Britain's freedom ever. So I had a draw uh, Desmond Swain competition, uh, won by a, a brilliant cartoonist called Kevin Wells. And anyway, he won this, which is a Desmond Swain mask made out of a pair of my old wife fronts. <laughs> and the next one please and then we've got to go and you know eat eat out to help out so that's a dog's dinner table 13 probably spread more covid than anything else the next one and we've got to open up uh, stuff for business so there is a there is johnson as a uh, as a spiv selling fur cups and all sorts of other things 
Um, and the next one, please. And we've all got to go back to work or go back to school because of a, a genius, an educational genius like Gavin Williamson, who I think was a fireplace salesman of the year 2007. I think that's reached the height of his competence. And the next one, please. And there we have uh, Dido, Queen of Carnage, this mate, this chum who's been appointed to all these actually really quite important jobs because these people are incompetent and corrupt cracks. Uh, which is what my work is all about. It's about pointing this out, it's about whispering in the ear of the conquering hero, you are mortal, but also you've got really stupid ears and you're an idiot. Um, because this needs to be pointed out. These people think they're in charge of our destinies. They think they're gods and they're not. They're just like you and me, as I always say, you know, um, it's the old Jewish gag. You know, they think they're, you know, they think they're better than you, but, you know, like you and me, they shit, and like you and me, they die. They shit and they die. Then Dido Harding, I understand, can ride a horse, which I can't, so I'll give her that. But I don't know what other qualifications she has to be in charge of life-saving systems, which should be in operation in this country, and don't work. And yet somehow she's still in office, somehow or other. The next one, please. And meanwhile, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer basically issued a rather terrifying statement. And I just saw them just have this image from Game of Thrones of them as the White Walkers. Winter is coming, spreading fear and terror. Uh, while at the same time, next one, please. Um, you have vast swathes of the Tory commentariat saying either there isn't a virus or you shouldn't wear masks or it's all overblown or it's all stuff and nonsense. Um, breathtakingly irresponsible, unbelievably irresponsible. And this is based on a Gilray cartoon about Jenner's uh, introducing uh, vaccinations against smallpox with cowpox. And in the original, you have all these cows bursting out of people's arms. So it's actually a satire on anti-vaxxing, 200 year old satire on anti-vaxxing. And here you have emerging out of people, you have David Icke and you have Piers Corbyn. So probably just as well that Jeremy isn't prime minister because his brother would be a mind blowing embarrassment at the moment. <laughs> says that COVID doesn't exist and it's all part of conspiracy by, um, I don't know, Masons on the moon or whatever. And, uh, and there are the rest of them <laughs> erupting all over the place. Uh, and there we are, here we are now. You're in Manchester, I wished I'd I wished I was there with you. I know. It, we it, seemed, it seemed we inappropriate. Did. It seemed inappropriate at this particular moment in time. Indeed. We did the right thing. We did the, we right, did the right thing. thing. Because, because here we are. And so I'm carrying on doing my work. Uh, my life has remained pretty much unchanged by this catastrophe, possibly the most catastrophic thing that's going to happen in any of our lives. We have no idea how it's going to finish. But I'm going to carry on pointing out that the people in charge have no better idea than I do, or you do, or any of the people watching this do, how to deal with this. So they should stop pretending and perhaps we should start being more collegiate and talking to each other about it, how we're gonna get our way through this. And something else I've been doing is I've been, since the middle of May, I've been writing a poem every day to reflect mm. how I'm feeling about these things, um, which you can see on my website. If you go to martinrosen.com under words, you'll see there's over a hundred of these things now. And also my friend John Tregenna, uh, who lives in Larne in South Wales, has been putting some of these to music. We're just about to launch next week, um, Plague Songs, The Second Wave. You can look up, if you look up Plague Songs. <laughs> Go it's, it's about, um, it's about uh, 10, in the, in the first one that came out in the summer, is, is about 10 of these poems put to music. Um, and quite magnificently, I, I can't do music, but you know, I, I did these things. John picked them up, he put them to music, he, presenting them to other people who then perform them. And uh, we've got the second wave coming up next week. And uh, I do recommend you go and have a look at it. And I, I created, we, we needed a, lo a logo for it. So I thought, what actually sums up this country at the moment? What single thing typifies Britain in 2020? And so if we could have the next one, please. I came up with this image, which is a burning mobility scooter. It just struck me as being the thing which sums us up. We're just crap. We, we are absolute shit. This country is absolute crap. We are led by clowns and incompetence. 
and we think that we're the greatest nation on earth. And we've been responsible for a higher death rate than anywhere else on earth. And that's what we are. We're a, mobility, we're a burning mobility scooter. But keep looking on the bright side. This is one of the images from Plague Songs, the second wave. So that's the next one. And that's, that's where I'm going to leave you with the images. So I always think you should look on the bright side. There we are. Happy Mr. Smiley Virus, I think we can call him. Well, that was chilling and sobering as well as very funny. And um, we're, we're really fortunate that the YouTube detectives obviously were on having a late lunch today. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> we may not have remained on air for as long as we did, but my God, I'm glad we did. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that for me is what comics are about, but particularly cartooning. It's a language we can speak to each other through that extraordinary language. I mean, uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience, um, but I also have one because it's so visceral and if you don't mind me saying, so grotesque and debauched, those cartoons you do, and you're such a soft and cuddly man. Where, where did that come from? <laughs> maybe there's no answer to that. It, maybe it's I mean, it's interesting. I mean um, years ago, I did, a, I did a thing for the British Council in Berlin, where I gave a talk of my recent work. This is just after the coalition came in, and it was similar to that, full of my, as you say, visceral and grotesque imagery. And um, as part of this this um, weekend of talks put on by the British Council. There was stuff from a, um, a novelist uh, who had written a, a book about his maladies. I'm um, just trying the best way to, he thought he had bowel cancer and then he thought he had prostate cancer. He had, he had all these, because he had to have a pee every 20 minutes and they couldn't work out what on earth was wrong with him until they realized that he was so physically stressed and emotionally stressed he sort of tied his perineum in a knot Ugh. and what he had to do it's called tim parks this guy what you had to do was to calm down was actually to calm down so he entered into a course of non-denominational transcendental meditation where he actually just calms down drains himself of all his anxieties because he was shortlisted for the booker prize and he spent three months writing his acceptance speech then he didn't get he didn't win it <laughs> echolocating into the future about what problem's going to happen next and just stressed him all the time so he does an hour of tm every day but i've never seen anybody quite so stressed in my entire life anyway in the bar after i'd given my talk he came up to me and said martin martin i mean that was that was brilliant it's very very funny but but i'm worried about your health because you're so angry about things you're so angry about things and i said tim look at yourself and look at me mm. I get angry about the things we should all get angry about. Competence, crankism, people thinking better than we are, and people thinking we're in charge of our destinies. And I get really angry about that, as we should all get angry. And then I spend the next four hours doing watercolors. There you go. There is the answer. <laughs> you said, you know, the language of comics, the language of cartoons, there is, there is I think, a qualitative difference between expressing yourself in writing which is you know five and a half thousand years old as opposed mm. to drawing which is part being human it's you know mm. at least forty thousand years old whereas writing is just a byproduct of accountancy and writing is about drawing up a list of taxes owed to the king and then a list of people who haven't paid their taxes who need to be killed so <laughs> writing is about theft and murder whereas drawing is about being human it's about being the beauty of life has filtered through the human imagination and there's something very powerful about that you know people seldom write to my text colleagues on whose columns I squat like a gargoyle, calling it a so-called column. Any cartoonist will tell you they always get this, your so-called cartoon. People wanting to deny that what we've done is even what we claim it to be, because mm -hmm. they nibble their way through the copy we squat on top of, and they swallow what we do whole. And it's interesting, I've spoken to lots of cartooning colleagues around the world to see what verb there is to describe how people consume what we produce and I have yet to find any language in which there is a precise verb to describe it it's not just looking it's not reading it's not watching it's something else and there isn't actually a word to describe what we do when we consume the visual wow. Creative. So it's, and, and I think that's really interesting Really interesting. Um, and in fact, it's so interesting. We've only got 10 minutes left, but we've got I've got all these pieces of paper coming at me with all these questions. 
So do you mind if we fire through them a bit and then That's squeeze fine. in the challenge which we are going to set for you and maybe for other aspiring political okay. cartoonists out there? Okay. Um, I'm not quite... I'm not quite sure where to start, but I mean, one of the early ones that came in was, um, have you been pulled, banned, one of your cartoons been pulled or banned um, for going too far? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, I, I kind of thought you might be saying that. <laughs> I, want, I once resigned from a paper because the editor kept on giving me ideas for cartoons um, and rejecting mine. Uh, and I finally just sent him an email saying, if you've got such brilliant ideas for cartoons, why don't you go to fucking draw? <laughs> I think that might be the only response. And how was it working with Boris at the Spectator? Did you work with Boris at the Spectator? Um, no, he wasn't editor when I was when I was at the Spectator. He had moved on, but I had met him a few times, and um, I, I did a one. I did a cover for him when he was editor of the Spectator. And this is a very very short version. Is he he wouldn't decide how he wanted the cover to appear because you've got to decide whether it's full bleed or things. Like that. And I finally I met him a few times. I finally asked the art director to put me through to him because we were getting close to deadline, and and he went blah 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 blah. And I said, because I was quite angry, I said, for once in your life, just drop this PG Woodhouse bullshit and give me some answers. And there was a long pause after which he said, I think you'll find what you call PG Woodhouse bullshit is certainly very well. That's fine. <laughs> sort of suggests, I was thinking. Also, sort of suggests it's all put on that he is, in fact, a psychopath. But you know, who am I to say? Absolutely. And um, we've got two questions, actually, which are more about the, the, the work, you know, the actual practical side of things. So I think you kind of answered it a bit. But do you paint or do you use digital? I don't know how to use digital. You will we did struggle with the Zoom, didn't we? So, <laughs> so you understand the difficulties we had in actually achieving this. It was, uh, yeah. Okay. And um, uh, yeah. It's it's painting. I think I I you know my advice to aspiring visual satirists who get in touch with us: use whatever medium you feel comfortable in, but don't forget the joy of getting dirty. Yeah. There is something joyous about Ralph Steadman because he's so dirty, mm. lucky. Mm. and splattery there is there's a great deal of pleasure rolling around in the filth great and um should an aspiring cartoonist be optimistic about the future work yes yes i mean the thing is people have said to me in the past you know oh god you're so cynical i'm not cynical at all i'm skeptical uh, and in fact i'm ridiculously idealistic and the reason i'm so angry if i am angry um it is because i'm constantly disappointed by what we get instead of people who would possibly run the country fairly competently and with a certain level of decency. And that's because I'm optimistic that it is possible to do that. Um, if I didn't think it was possible to do that, I'd probably go and become an accountant. Yeah. A very, well, very bad accountant, a very, very bad accountant. On the subject of optimism, um, uh, Michael here says, Mr. Rosen, having studied the pandemic so intensely, do you think anything the government or any parliamentarians have done has ever been at all reasonable, decent or reassuring? I think um, there are tiny gobbits of all of those things, but yep. usually too late, usually too diluted, um, because they're making political calculations when they shouldn't be making political calculations. They should be making calculations about safeguarding the welfare and lives of the citizens whom they are elected to represent. Um, and if they don't want to do that, they should go and do something else. But they're, but they're just thinking about, you know, make, making the, you know, the clown Cummings is thinking about reforming the civil service when the country is burning around his ankles. Uh, and he should be removed from office. What on earth are we allowing our country to be treated as a playpen for this nerd for? I think there are many, many examples, sadly, of that. But uh, maybe we shouldn't get into a political conversation. Um, long, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a bit late for that. But yeah. um, with five minutes to, to go, um, you did kindly, may, I hope you haven't changed your mind, but you did kindly offer to take on a challenge overnight. Um, and we have gathered up some ideas. Now, I think you also were putting it out there, as it were, and saying, well, if I choose this challenge and other people would like to have a go as well, then you're very welcome. Absolutely. Um, and you can have a look at what they've produced and perhaps we'll even choose a winner tomorrow if we get enough of yeah. those. Um, I could quickly, if you like, as I say, we've only got five minutes left, but um, give you, there are seven challenges here potentially. Okay. And you could quickly um, say no to one and just say very quickly say why and then eventually tell us which one you think is a goer, if one is. So the first one is uh, Pretty Patel trying to catch migrants, maybe a bit like Elmer Fudd from Bugs Bunny. That's quite a nice one. Let me hear them all and I'll then decide. Okay. Uh, the cabinet retraining as rock stars. 
based on the uh, alleged uh, comment from Rishi Sunak that uh, the entertainment industry ought to think about taking another turn in their career. Again, a good idea. <laughs> Uh, Ed Davey hires a minibus for the Lib Dem away day. Um, my only problem with that is you could draw Ed Davey for a million years and nobody will know it's Ed Davey because nobody knows what Ed Davey looks like. Good point. So that one's off the agenda. The agenda. Um, Graham Brady explodes and creates a black hole in space. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy for anybody out there to try and draw that in a static image. <laughs> yeah, it's more of an animation, perhaps. J.K. Yeah. Rowling's Book of Brexit spells. Nah. Nah. Okay, James Bond going into retirement for another six months. Um, doesn't. I don't see how it's visual. Yeah. Okay. And Biden Trump pairing for the next presidential debate. That has great potential in it. Great. Okay, so. Of those, um, well, I think I think that um, all you guys out there should do any of these you want to, um, because you know who am I to tell you what to do? But I'm going to do I'm going to do Biden and Trump preparing for um, the next debate. Not least of all, because I have never drawn Joe Biden. Oh, so this will be first. And right? therefore, I ought to get in practice. <laughs> Marvellous. OK, so um, for anybody out there who wants to give it a go, I think we'll say that it can be work in progress. As long as it's a yeah. recognisable cartoon in some shape or form, yeah. we'll be very happy to receive that. Um, and you can send it digitally. That's obviously the only way that we can take those entries. Um, to carol at comicartfestival.com. That's carol with an E at comicartfestival.com. And we should fix the time. I think if you set the deadline for yourself, then we'll ask other people to, to, to go with that. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, how, are you, how are you fixed tomorrow morning? Um, we'll work that one out in the next couple of hours and let you know. <laughs> and we'll see where it best fits into the, the live schedule. Yeah, um, let's see, let's, see uh, let's say the deadline, um, because this is what this is all about. It's yeah. about deadlines. Yeah. Um, and many times in my career, I had the idea for the most brilliant cartoon ever. That another news story comes along, and there goes my most brilliant cartoon ever. So you've got four hours from now. So you've got to finish this by seven o'clock this evening. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So seven o'clock, Carol with an E at comicartfestival.com. Um, we will um, work out with you, Martin, an exact time tomorrow when we can reveal what you've produced and also hopefully choose a winner from some entries, we hope. Um, but that's been uh, one of the most intense and weirdly enjoyable hours that I think I've spent in a long, long time. You might say you should get out more, but um, I think I'll stay in more and look at your cartoons. Stay in! <laughs> keep, keep away. And I, and I have to say, having um, both read your poetry and had a mini recital, I think, uh, when we were all over in the States last year, I would heartily recommend people going to the website and having a look at the uh, poem a day that you've been producing. I think your poetry is just extraordinary. Thank you. And um, really fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again briefly tomorrow. Um, and all I want to do now is thank Martin again and thank Chris, the uh, unwilling assistant um, who's been moving on the slide so beautifully. Uh, thank our main funder, Arts Council England, our main sponsor, Lenovo. Thank you all for watching. Um, and if you feel the urge to donate uh, money, that is, you can go on our website and press the heart at the top of the screen and we will gladly accept anything you can give us to support our free festival. Uh, thank you very much and we'll see you again in a few minutes. Good joy. Thank you.